front and center, man. You got to grab that thing and show us what's what's the story there, man. That's like uh, that's big time, man. Yeah, that was uh, some big old fish this weekend. <laughs> that that's awesome, man. Congratulations. I appreciate it. I know. Uh, so just so I can introduce everybody, this is Brandon Fulgram. Uh, your partner's Eric Cagle, correct? Right. And uh, these are the champions of the Crappie Masters National Qualifier, Grenada, Mississippi. Not, I mean, the lake, the, the home of the three pound fish. Um, incredible job, man. That was that was awesome. Man, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely something. It took me twelve years to do it, you know. And you, uh, <clears throat> as much as we fish and got on that lake, you know, everybody just kind of every time a tournament comes to town, and you just kind of expected, you know, and it's very tough especially on your home lake that's that's the hardest for me so it, it's the pressure of knowing that people have the expectation you're going to do well and uh i can imagine well, that that is, that is tough well it's not necessarily the pressure it's it's uh i would say i would say it's definitely uh, to a spot to where you know too much about the lake you know um you know, when, when you pick with a plan and it's not happening, then you, you know, you start fishing off memories. Well, I caught a three pounder over on that stump six miles from here. And you, before you know that you got your foot in the pedal and you're making it scream and trying to find something and, and you yeah. spend more time running around the lake than you do fishing. The, uh, so, so give everybody just a little background of, cause you are a guide. I think you, do you run the, you run the guide service on the lake, correct? Yes, sir. I own it. Yes, sir. So, so, so tell me the story of the guide service. Uh, talk about it because I know a lot of people want to get to Grenada and that you might as well take advantage and, and let people know about your service over there. Because, so I want to know, I want everything, I want to know about that, the guide service that you run there. Yeah. Hey, we, um, man, we stay busy. We start in February. Um, got myself, Patrick Stone, Bruce Thornton, uh, Eric Cagle. He's going to be over here this summer helping us a little bit. Um, We've got five or six good guides. Um, we we pretty much run three to four trips a day, uh, February through pretty much mid November. Um, we've got some real nice lodging here in town. Uh, really nice places. Um, nice equipment, top of the line boats, uh, Ranger boats. Um, pretty good stuff. We we do it right, no doubt. No doubt about it. The uh, so let's talk about the tournament. So uh, you and Eric uh, go out the first day. What's the plan? And uh, is is everything going as planned? Uh, talk about your first day experience out there. Yep, uh, man. Hey, nothing went as planned the first day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, he we he had found some fish and I had found some fish and. Um, you know, uh, the fish, he had caught some fish. He was doing a guide trip for me on, I think, Tuesday. And uh, he had he had gotten a little spot. And he had caught three fish that was well over three pounds on Tuesday. And wow. um, and the Sunday Sunday before the tournament, um, I had gotten in a little spot on a trip and, and found some big fish. And, and uh, I actually weighed, I think it was 2064 on a guide trip Sunday before the tournament. Oh, and uh so we we had we had two or three good spots and uh tuesday came around and i went back in there and i checked on that spot where i caught the fish sunday and they they were they were gone they, they weren't there and uh wednesday rolled around and and uh I, I pulled in there to go check it and i, I actually saw somebody pre-fishing and they, they were really close to it so i didn't go in there i just kept on going and thursday i got to go back to it and uh nothing they, they weren't there and uh the fish that eric was on he we were just pretty much banking that they were still going to be there there was a lot of traffic around in that area so he didn't go back didn't want to be seen and and uh friday morning we went in there and uh man it was it was like a ghost town you know we put that live scope down and we started scanning and it was nothing we uh, i think at 12 12 30 we had us three fish one of them weighed 0.99 one of them weighed 108 and one of them weighed 120 wow and uh <clears throat> i told him i said man i had a spot on the yellow bush side up around Choctaw there and and uh i you know i knew we could go get some good fish there i, I knew we wasn't going to get a win and wait there but i knew we could go you know get us 15 16 pounds off of it and uh 
we were headed that way and was running up the schooner, headed around back around to the yellow bush side. And man, something just hit me. And I told Cagle, I said, man, we got to go check it, you know, and, and, and we pulled in there. And uh, as soon as we put the trolling motor down, I mean, I was, I was looking at one that was, she was 288 because we caught her. Uh-huh. Um, but I think the difference was of why those fish were there uh, Friday and they weren't the rest of the week was Sunday when I caught them in there, it was raining and it was a north wind and it was cloudy. And the rest of the week, pretty much the times I went back in there, the sun was shining and it was sunny. And I think when that sun came out and, and <clears throat> that pressure changed, those fish moved back into those bushes. And then, and then Friday, you know, Friday it was raining and it was a north wind again and the wind was blowing and it was cloudy. And those fish pulled back out of those, those bushes and they were out on the edge of them. And when we got in there Friday, uh, first fish we caught was a 288. And I mean, no longer than we got her in the boat, I just started scanning again and saw another one. And, and uh, in a matter of about an hour, we had a little over 16 pounds Friday afternoon. And uh, we knew we had to upgrade. And um, I think it was at 235 or 240, uh, about 20, 25 minutes left to go. We caught that one that weighed 321. Wow. And then uh, I think with five minutes left to go, 255, we caught another one. She was 291, I think is what she weighed. That, wow. that gave it that gave us our big weight friday and uh we never saw anybody there uh we, we weren't sharing fish with anybody um we had them to ourselves and uh um, <clears throat> getting wondering you know and and we were talking and what happened was we could have had a much better weight on friday but the fish were running from us and they was getting in those bushes on us and uh, we just decided we're going to ride or die right there. The winning, We knew the winning fish was right there. And so we went back in there Saturday morning, and we had a plan that we were just going to keep my boat up against the bushes. So when those fish spook, try to run them out into the open water instead of back into the bushes where we could chase them with the live scope. And, uh, right. man, it worked. I mean, <clears throat> it was the most epic day of, of tournament fishing I ever had. Um, we got there – an hour before fishing time and then about 6 30 6 40 uh we put the trolling motor down with the live scope and i mean there was just giants everywhere i mean everywhere you scan <laughs> i mean literally it was it was nuts everywhere you scanned it i mean we were looking at two on fish and uh we got on one and i told eric i said you you stay on her till seven o'clock and and we had her in the scope and and I'm I'm watching the watching the time and we're six fifty six and six fifty eight and seven o'clock came and man we dropped it in there and bam we caught one. She was two seventy one. Had her in the boat at six oh one. I mean seven oh one, I'm sorry. And uh by seven by seven forty five that morning, fishing time was seven o'clock. By seven forty five we had uh, we had a little over eighteen pounds in the boat. We had six of the seven of our way fish in forty five minutes, and uh, <clears throat> Mike Valentine came in there with the camera boat, was filming us, and uh, we caught a two fifty six there when he was there, and I think that was around eight fifteen, eight thirty, <laughs> and uh, we had us. I think it was nineteen nineteen on our scales at eight thirty in the morning, and you know. I, and I've been in a lot of places where, you know, you were sitting good in the first day or you were just leading after the first day or you're a couple spaces back and 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 just the whole second day going, man, and I got four big ones. I need three more. You know, it what this case wasn't like that. I mean, it was 830 in the morning. We had over 19 pounds. I mean, I was talking to Kegel about going to Jack and Rips and eating a hamburger. What? We'd see them at the way in, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, Give me the strategy on again getting between yourselves and the bushes so that you're you're just you're keeping the fish away from going back into the bushes. Yeah, what what they were doing was the, the fish were they weren't actually in the bushes this day. They were they would be 30, 40 feet out off the bush line, just kind of suspended in the open water. And and those really big ones, when we would get, you know, we would see them in the scope, we were scoping them 60 feet out. And 
when we would get up to them and start dialing them in and we'd get about 30 feet from them, those really big ones, they would just start easing off, you know, back to the bushes. And we were losing a bunch of big fish like that. They were getting in the bushes on us. And that's what we decided to do Saturday was to put my boat right up against the bushes. And, and literally we just rubbed the bush line all morning looking for those fish and, and it worked when when the fish comes, they would go straight out to even further out in the open water. And once they got way out there in that open water, it didn't matter how much they ran, we were going to catch them. You know, they couldn't get away from us. And uh, that's what <laughs> right. we did. And we one fish we caught. So how, Saturday. How, how... Go ahead. That, that, that one, that biggest fish that we caught Saturday, uh, I bet we chased her for 20 minutes before she gave it up. Uh, we finally got her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She ran from us. How deep, how deep, like, let's just talk about that big fish. How deep was that fish? And, and, and what was kind of the, what was the standard across a, a board? How, how deep were these fish? N none of the big fish that we caught um, were, were deeper than six feet. Most of them were at four. And how are you, how are you getting so close to these fish? So to, how how long are the poles you're using? I know you're an H and H guy. Um, how how far are you getting out there? We were we were we were using twelve foot H and H typhoons. Um, I wouldn't pitch to the fish, and Kegel wouldn't pitch to the fish until we got within twelve feet of it. We 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 was trying to get them with, within ten to twelve feet, and they weren't really spooky. You know, the only time they ever spooked on you was because you bumped the boat or you made a noise or something. Um, or they heard the trolling motor. And so when we would start easing up to those fish, we would start backing that trolling motor back real soft and doing it real, you know, nonchalant and real casual, getting really close to them. And most of the time they wouldn't spook. Uh, but yeah, when we got within 12 feet of them and, and we pitched to some that were 16, 20, we actually caught some casting as well, you know, when they were on out 20, 25 feet. Uh, but we tried to get them within 10 to 12 feet. And I would just, we would just sling that jig out there to them and just watch it on the scope and just let it fall right down. And when it got to the top of their head, just kind of hold up on it and just hold it there right, right, right. right in the nose. And they couldn't stand it. They had to eat it. You know, <laughs> when you were holding it right on their nose, they were going to eat it. <laughs> uh, Did you downsize your baits to allow it to float like it was doing? Uh, I mean, what size jig we heads? didn't we didn't the fish the fish weren't they they weren't that finicky you know they were more aggressive friday and saturday than they had been all week right. uh we used eighth ounce black and uh short, or, orange uh been uh grenade lake tackle company jig heads and uh <clears throat> you know um it wasn't very windy and if it had been windy we would have went to some quarters or something but uh, we got away with the eights because they were they they were they were active. You know, you didn't have to hold long or anything like they did. Eat it. We stuck with the, uh, all we can. So, both you and Eric are both accomplished fishermen, both very experienced. You know what you're doing. How do you? I mean, manage that. I, what I saw when you saw guys with live scope, you see usually one guy running the trolling motor and letting the other guy doing all the the scoping and, and, and actually catching the fish, but you guys are two accomplished fishermen. How are you managing that in the boat? What's the, what's the thought process? Um, man, Hey, what we did was if a fish was on his side of the boat, he would pitch to it. Fish was on my side of the boat. I'd pitch to it. And w when we got to the fish and, you know, you're not going to make a perfect pitch every time, you know? Uh, and if one of us would miss, you know, we'd be short or long or whatever the Eric or, or I would be better we'd both be ready. And if I'd missed, he'd be right there behind me. And if he missed, I mean, by the time he got it out, I was coming in behind him, you know, we weren't wasting a lot of time. Right. And it worked out well that well, that way. Uh, just, you know, the, the, the problem with that was, was you had to get your time and just right for when he would pitch and when I would pitch, because if you, if you were off just a little bit, you'd get your lines tangled. And, and we did one time, and it cost us on, on a good fish. We got our lines tangled, and it, it cost us. Uh, but you, you, it can be done, and you got to be careful doing it. Um, but it, we worked well. We did it well. Are you both utilizing 12-footers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Both 12-foot 12 uh, foot rods, and uh, we kept a little 6-foot. Uh, Eric designed a little 6-foot dock shooter. Um, we kept one right there that, you know, when, when they got spooky, uh, we could – 
you know, shoot it out there 20, 25 feet and, and not have to get up on them um, as close. Uh, but the big fish, the biggest fish we saw this week on live scope, um, we couldn't catch them. Um, and when, I, when I'm telling you big, I, I'm talking, I mean, Kegel would agree, I'm talking three and three quarter plus pound fish. Uh, they would hit us, they would short strike us, and we couldn't catch them. And uh, I bet I bet there was one fish in particular I remember. Uh, I bet she, I bet she bit six times, right. and we never got a hook in her. Um, and and that's one thing I noticed about those big fish is, is is there there was two fish in particular this weekend that were just bigger than anything I'd ever seen on live scope. And those fish, when you drop that jig down to them, they would just go vertical on it and come straight up, and it's like they put their nose right there to it. And they would just sit there and just smell it, smell it, smell it, and then just swim off. Really? And uh, those big fish, man, uh, you know, that live scope has taught me more about crappie. You know, we just thought we knew something about crappie fishing. You get you a live scope and you really start watching what's happening and you realize that we didn't know anything, <laughs> you know? So so with uh, your, so tell us, give us give us some of the, the, the things that it's taught you the most. Well, that live scope has taught me that that color matters, no doubt. And for an instance, Saturday, uh, Kegel was using a, uh, a, a Bobby Garland Cajun Cricket shad about three inches, and it was a it was a it was an orange kind of a dull orange and a green pumpkin tint to it. And um, I was just using a regular uh, orange and chartreuse and. I would pitch to that fish and that fish would whirl around on it and act like she was going to hit it and she wouldn't. And Eric would drop that, that jig that he had in there. And I mean, just bam, they would hit it. And we knew to switch, you know, and, and, and that worked. And, um, and the behavior of some of those fish, you know, I, I couldn't tell you how many times that you would drop a jig down to that fish and that fish gets so excited about that jig being there that she would whirl around and snap at it and just completely miss it. Um, that and, and noise in the boat. Um, man, if there's one thing I could tell anybody and that, that would be noise in the boat. Um, one fish this weekend, I was actually putting a fish in the live well and, and Eric hollered and he said, Hey, be still, don't move. There's a big one. And, and, I just kind of turned around and when I did, I could see the screen up there and I saw the fish coming and I just as lightly as I could just started tipping back to the front of the boat. Cause I knew he was supposed to catch her to get the net. And I mean, I made one step in that boat and she gone. Really? And, and it makes you wonder how he ever caught a fish spider rigging, you know? Um, and that, that's, you know, I've had more fun live scoping. Um, but this, you know, the whole live scope epidemic has, has kind of taken it away from what we used to do, you know, and that was spider rig. And we used to take our hummingbirds and go side imaging and we'd side image those crappie and then go out there and put poles in them and catch them and we caught them. Right. You know, but we weren't watching them. We weren't watching the behavior of what those fish were doing. And and, and now when you see it, it's just, <clears throat> it's, it's absolutely amazing to what those fish can do and how fast those fish can move you know just like those big fish you know when when they when they when they when those fish turn around and they run from you and you start following them you can watch them and those fish will just be going and going and going especially the big ones you're being you know 13 15 20 foot of water and when you start gaining ground on her following her you'll just watch her she'll just sink all the way down to the bottom yeah then you just start swimming along the bottom a while and then you'll just keep following her now one thing i can tell people and this is a hundred percent fact and eric kegel will, will agree to it what we found this weekend was when those big fish went to the bottom and you stayed on them if you were if you kept yourself in a position to when they started coming back up off the bottom if you could pitch that jig out there ahead of them when they were vertical coming back up a hundred percent you were going to catch that fish wow if you could keep your boat in position of, of when that fish came up off the bottom to come back up if you if you was there and you was ready and say what we were in 13 14 feet of water when that fish was on the bottom in 13 14 feet of water and when she when she started coming back up and she got to within about 10 feet we were pitching you know 
she was 10 feet down coming back up. We were pitching. And when she would get about to four feet, that jig would just meet her right there in the face and she'd eat it every single time. It's like they can't help it. She 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 would eat it. Uh, every fish we done like that, we caught them. So the I guess the idea is what? That the fish is feeling safe. So they're now they're coming back up and 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 now they're ready to eat again. It's like uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I don't know that, that they're ready to eat. I think it's just an instinctive thing that she's. I, th I think it's more of a body position of that fish because you know watching the fish over the live scope over the last year or so. You know when when you drop that jig to that fish, she will she 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 sees it and she just gets completely vertical on it and, and yeah. eats it. And it's kind of the same thing with those fish coming off the bottom after you're chasing them. They're almost kind of getting vertical as they're coming back up. And I just think it's just an instinctive thing that they see it. They're vertical already and boom, they eat it. Man, um, that's a great point, dude. That's totally, I mean, you're absolutely right. I always say nose up when I'm fishing. I say when the fish goes nose up, I know they're going to, they're going to go out. They're going to hit it. And those, uh, those, those big ones this weekend, um, we had we had my we had my unit so dialed in at times, and you can you but Kegel would would fully agree that you would drop that jig to that fish, and you could almost see that that fish when she went vertical to eat it, she would start quivering really hard before she would eat it. And you, if you ever saw that quiver, you better get ready. <laughs> um, so talk about the uh, electronics that you have on your boat. Talk about the live scope system, the screen that you use. You hey, yeah, I run a, uh, I run a, I run a Garmin twelve twenty two, just strictly a uh, standard twelve twenty two, nothing else, just strictly for live scoping. Um, I've got my live scope transducer on a uh, Minkota Ultrax, and I've got, I've got it on the Ultrax standoff mount, and it's mounted to my trolling motor. Um, I know some guys like to use the poles and and everything, but I, I like to use my trolling motor, and and the reason why I do is because. You know, I fished with it so long enough that that I don't really have to look at my screen or look at my trolling motor to make a pitch. You know, it's when I'm chasing that fish and you know I'm moving my trolling motor left or right, I, I know where my footy is now, and and so I've done it for so long. I I can tell, you know, without having to look at the trolling motor, look at the unit, then go. I can just look at the unit and feel off my foot which way I need to take it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like it on the trolling motor. And I'll always keep it on the trolling motor simply because I know where my foot is and I know where I can make the pitch according to my foot. So a lot of people say like that your partner is they, they don't know that. So like when we're, when we're fishing, you know, they, they're secondary because they don't, you, you instinctively know where your foot's at without even looking at it, but they have to look at it. Yep. They, 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 they have to look at the, uh, they have to look at the trolling motor head. Sure do. Um, and, and, and that's what was tough for me at times this weekend when, you know, times when Kegel was running the trolling motor uh, and, and I ran it. Um, it was, you know, my pitches weren't perfect sometimes because when he was on it, you know, I I would look at the trolling motor, especially if he was on a hard right or, or a hard left, you know, being on his other side, looking at that, the, the, the distance was off. And I made some bad pitches and because of it. So, but your rule of thumb really on the on the boat is if the fish is on the left side, it's it's yours as a whoever's operating the trolling motor, I assume. Yep. And then on the right side is the is the partner. Yep, that's what we did. Yes. That's a good rule of thumb. I haven't heard that before. That's excellent. Yep. So. Um, and, and, and and you know, and when that happened, it's, if you, if there was a bad pitch made, we was ready to be backed up, you know, because once you get once you get a fish of that caliber inside 12 feet. 15 to 10 feet and 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 you know she may be moving and and you're you know she, she may be swimming slowly and you're you're on her at 12 feet and you've got a good picture of her and you flip it out there you know just because you can see her good and just because that jig came by that fish right she may not have saw it or she may not have ate it or you may have it may have come by her right behind her gear gill plate it looked good to you on the unit, but it may have come by her, by her right behind her gill plate, not her top of her eyes. And she may have never saw it, right. you know? And, and so, and that's what I, what I meant by when pitch pitch, you know, and cause once you get that fish of that caliber inside 12 feet and you're trying to catch her, 
she's not going to give you that much time. I mean, there's a very – that first pitch is crucial, especially if she stopped. If she stopped and, and she's not alarmed and you've got a good pitcher over and she's centered up, if you jack that first pitch up on her, you know, most of the time she's going to move. And then you got to start the process. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that, that first pitch is crucial, no so, doubt. So are you doing everything you can at that point not to touch the trolling motor, not to, to, to – I mean, we are we dead still at that well, point? Well, no, a lot of times you're not going to be dead. You're not ever going to be dead still. Uh, but – you know, keeping your foot on the trolling motor, when you're getting ready to make a pitch, you know, you may make that pitch and you may see your jig hit the water, but the, the fish isn't very clear or she may be a little subtle or she may be turned away from you. You know, so while your jig is, is coming, you may have to adjust your, your foot to, to kind of clear everything up while the jig is coming. And uh, and that's, why, that's what I like about that old Trex is it's real quiet and I'm able to take my foot and move that head ever so gently to where it doesn't go, eh, 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 you know. Right. Yeah. Um, one thing I can tell people that's trying to do it with a trolling motor remote, that it you, you're going to spook a lot of fish. Right. Uh, they do not like that head moving around like that. Um, that's why I use my, we use our foot just to make it move slow to where it doesn't make a noise. Uh, but yep, you got to adjust sometimes, even on a pitch while your bait's falling, you may have to move that trolling motor to line it up just right or, or get her lined up. Um, and sometimes it can be just perfect. And one thing I can tell people is, you know, uh, guiding, you know, trying to guide live scoping. Um, I might have that fish lined up perfect and, and my client make a pitch and doesn't see his jig, you know, where he either went too far left or too far right. You know, and what I have to try to make them understand is, is don't try to don't try to make that cast something it's not. When you make that pitch and you don't see your bait, it's because you're not where it is. And I immediately get it out. Right. Start over. You know, don't try to drag it in and do all that. You're going to waste a lot of time and you're going to spook a lot of fish. You make that pitch. You don't see it to jerk it out. Put it back. Right. <laughs> that's that's excellent dude I, I, that's awesome so did you lose any fish on the second day anything that you i mean would you change anything i mean obviously you had the, the winning formula but we, like we did we 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 lost a uh <clears throat> i'm not gonna say how big the fish was because i really don't know uh but i never saw it um but we we know what she looked like on live scope and she was bigger than anything we had we had touched all weekend and uh she ate it I set the hook and I had her for about half. She was coming about halfway up. You know, you could feel that old head shake and we lost her. And, you know, and uh, that was at about lunchtime. Um, but we just, we, you know, I told Kegel that morning, you know, it's, it's eight o'clock, eight 30 and, and we've got over 19 pounds in the boat. And this was one day that I actually felt that we were two bites away from breaking crappie masters, all time record, seven fish record. You know, really, right. if you wanted to get technical as big as fish that, that we were on, we were one bite away from breaking it. Right. And uh, man, all day long, we just couldn't, we, we couldn't get that sure enough big bite. And, and that's what we needed. You know, we were culling 250s, 240s, 252s. I mean, we could have weighed 17 and a half pounds five times Saturday. <laughs> That's uh, crazy. <laughs> we That's we crazy. just couldn't get that big bite, you know. And uh, But, hey, you know, and you talk about that kind of weight, 1903, you know, when – when uh, what's his name and his son weighed that 1964 Saturday. Yeah. You know, I, I was doing the math in my head. And uh, I knew it was going to be close. And um, it was just one of them deals to where you really don't realize, you know, when you're coming up to weigh your fish that you need 1890 on seven fish to take a lead on something. Man, that is that is crazy. That, you can't fathom that. And and uh, and and, I, and, and, Car and uh, Eric, he agreed, you know, Saturday we, before we came to weigh in, we knew we had over 19 pounds. And we were still worried that we we might not have enough. Wow! You know that's that's what kind of fishery Grenada is right now, and how big those fish are out there is, you know, you got nineteen pounds over nineteen pounds in the boat. You're worried about getting beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
And, and that's the kind of fish that we looked at Saturday. So, so it's changed your guide service. It's changed the way you fit. Everybody's changed the way they're, they fished in the last two years. Um, yeah, it, Patrick and Bruce and them, um, everybody can't live scope and it's not for everybody. Um, what I'm doing is, is I'm pretty much giving, giving the clients a choice. Hey, you want a live scope or, you, you know, you can still live scope and spider rig. You just can't cover the water as fast as you can single polling as you can spider rig and live scope. Um, I spider rigged all last year live scoping and it worked great. Um, but we're just giving them a choice of what they want to do and, and uh, letting it be that. Yeah. One, a couple of other questions, the colors you were using in terms of jigs and the weight line, high vis clear talk, talk a little bit more about equipment that you were using to win it. And uh, yeah, appreciate it. I, Kegel, he was using some high vis uh, braid. Um, I don't like it. I don't like high vis. Uh, I was using some, some, uh, some 10 pound clear uh, strand. Um, I can't remember what I think he was using a, a, a 10 pound diameter braid as well. Uh, high vis yellow. Um, like I said, we were using Patrick Stone's grenade like tackle company, black and uh, orange uh, football heads, and and that Bobby Garland Cajun cricket. Um, I can't remember what the name of that is. Something shad. Uh, it's an ugly thing, looks like a caterpillar. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. I'd, I'd never seen one. Actually, Eric said he he saw them in an academy on the way to the lake and picked up a couple packs of them. <laughs> um, but that that's what we used. Uh, HH reels, um, 1222 Garmin unit, um, Humminbird electronics for mapping. Um, there's just I think there's just nothing that compares to Humminbird's maps. Uh, but yeah, that's what got it. That's awesome, dude. Did you guys know your bait color before you even showed up that day? Were you like, oh, this is the this is what we're doing? Well, um, you know, Friday, you know, I, I just went fishing with what I've been fishing with all, all day, every week, you know, every day that week. Uh, up until up until Saturday, it really didn't seem to matter what you put in front of them. As long as you got it in front of them and held it there a minute, they, they'd pop it. Uh, Saturday, that was not the case. I mean – I dropped it on a lot of fish Saturday that just wouldn't eat it. And he, and, he, and he could come right behind me with that thing he had. And I mean, literally just first time he'd drop it down there, they'd eat it, you know, and that that's, that's really the first time on live scope that I've ever seen that something made that bit of a difference. And uh, it was, it was pretty shocking. Wow. Sure. That's awesome. Hey, Brandon, I want to congratulate yourself, you, Eric Cagle, um on winning that championship. Very impressive number. I, I mean, I, we've everybody knows you guys are incredible fishermen, but what you guys did this last weekend was was awesome, second to none. And we appreciate the tips and everything you've talked about and how you guys brought home that big, beautiful trophy behind you. Hey, thanks, bud. So, hey, thanks again. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you.